morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me in the back. Um, as Alessandro mentioned, I'm the high throughput, I'm at the high throughput imaging facility, or HITIF, at the National Cancer Institute uh, NIH in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, and today I would like to present you some of the most recent results from uh, our facility and some of our uh, collaborators. Um, I structured the presentation in uh, three parts. Uh, the first part uh, will be a general introduction about automedia macroscopy or high throughput imaging. Uh, and then I want to tell you uh, two stories uh, about uh, two different uh, applications of high throughput imaging uh, to um, um, address uh, questions, uh, biological questions, that uh, were not previously uh, uh, addressed. So uh, let me start by uh, telling you a little bit about uh, high throughput imaging, or HDI. High throughput imaging, uh, sometimes known also as high content screening or high content imaging, uh, is a technique that is based on fluorescence microscopy. And so uh, pretty much as more traditional fluorescence microscopy approaches, uh, we have an imaging-based uh, uh, cellular assay, uh, of course, based on the use of a microscope. Uh, and we use the imaging-based cellular assay uh, to test the effect of an experimental uh, treatment uh, by measuring a phenotypic uh, change. And of course, by measuring phenotypic changes, we can infer uh, the nature or the function of the experimental treatment. And when I say experimental treatment, I mean most of the times uh, sRNA, uh, uh, sRNA treatments uh, to knock down gene expressions or a small molecule compounds. What high throughput imaging really brings to the table is the use of automation at every step of the process. Started, uh, starting from the use of automated liquid handling uh, for the dispensing of experimental treatments uh, in a high throughput manner, continuing to the use of high throughput microscopy uh, for uh, image acquisition, and all the way, of course, to uh, high content image analysis for the automated uh, uh, analysis of large uh, quantities of uh, images. And so expanding uh, on this vision of high throughput imaging or HDI, as I mentioned before, uh, we have systematic perturbations that can be either compounds, uh, oligo-SRNAs, and now uh, we are seeing a few examples of also R8 screens uh, with uh, CRISPR Cas9 <coughs> reagents. Uh, we then have the high throughput microscopy part, and I'll get into this uh, a little bit more in the next uh, few slides in uh, multi-well plates. Uh, and then I count an image analysis. And this is where uh, different uh, ways of uh, using high throughput imaging really start differing in the analysis phase, uh, where we can use uh, high throughput imaging for screening applications, again, mostly compounds and uh, sRNA reagents, for profiling uh, both compounds and sRNA reagents. Profiling applications are similar to screens, but rather than looking at one or few uh, parameters extracted with high content image analysis, the goal here is uh, to rather really profile, uh, get a description of the experimental treatment by looking at hundreds or possibly thousands of different uh, phenotypic measurements. And finally, and, and this is what I'm really going to be talking about today, uh, it's an application of high throughput imaging that is not dedicated to screening or to profiling, but rather, use, uh, rather using automated microscopy uh, to uh, define with high precision uh, extremely rare or um, uh, extremely uh, detailed biological uh, events. So in terms of high throughput imaging acquisition, um, as I mentioned before, uh, we perform all our experiments in multi-well plates. They can either be 96 or 34 well format. Uh, and these multi-well plates uh, contain uh, different uh, compartments or wells. Uh, where uh, each well corresponds to a separate uh, experiment. And as I mentioned before, there can be up to 34 per plate. And of course, in an experimental campaign, we can screen up to tens or hundreds of uh, these plates so that we can test possibly tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of uh, different experimental treatments. These microwell plates are clear bottom, so they can be imaged uh, from uh, below. Cells are seated in these plates, treated in these plates, and then uh, fix and uh, stain uh, with um, fluorescent reagents, as I'll show you uh, in a little bit. 
Uh, the idea is that once the, the plates are uh, stained, uh, we can acquire images uh, with, uh, again, automated uh, microscopes that have automated stages that can move in X, Y, and Z. Uh, generally, also an autofocus lasers to maintain uh, focus while uh, the plate uh, is moving. Uh, so that uh, it's possible to acquire uh, multiple fields of view uh, uh, images in multiple positions on a per well basis, thus uh, increasing the throughput in terms of number of cells that can be uh, acquired for experimental condition. Uh, but also since we're using fluorescence microscopy, it's also possible to acquire images uh, in up to uh, four channels on most instruments uh, these days. And since uh, some of these instruments, as I show you uh, in, in, in one of the stories, is, is actually um, um, a spinning disk on focal microscope, uh, it's also possible to uh, acquire uh, um, information about 3D uh, volumes. And uh, thanks to the use of environmental chamber units, it's also possible to perform automated time lapse uh, experiments, uh, thus measuring kinetic properties of uh, biological uh, phenomena. And this is the focus of the second story that I'll tell you uh, about today. Regardless uh, of the approach uh, chosen, uh, most of the times if one wants to screen millions of compounds, uh, there will be mostly one or a few uh, fields, very few channels, and definitely not Z-stacking and not uh, time. Uh, whereas if one wants to really uh, dig deep into a biological phenomenon and the kinetics, uh, one will acquire very few uh, wells uh, at, uh, with high magnification objectives uh, and with a lot of uh, time points. But regardless uh, of the approach, uh, modern instruments can produce uh, hundreds of thousands of images on a per day uh, basis. And this means that it's impossible to uh, analyze these images um, by hand or just by having a postdoc or a student uh, just pointing at objects uh, in the image. And this is why uh, we and others uh, really take advantage of high content uh, image analysis or automated image analysis to uh, first uh, segment uh, cells, objects. <coughs> uh, this is in, I would say, 99% of the cases is done uh, through the use of uh, stain uh, for uh, DNA, uh, generally either DAPI or Cox, uh, that can be used uh, to segment uh, nuclei so that now the uh, software can automatically re recognize single nuclei. And then if other um, uh, cellular stainings uh, are uh, present, for example, for the cytoplasm or for other regions in the cell, the software can segment uh, the other subcellular regions. And then uh, it's possible to measure a variety of cellular features. And I'll talk to the, about this in the next slide. And these cellular features are nothing but numbers. So what we're doing here, it's measuring properties of the cells. What kind of properties? Uh, these image analysis features tend to fall into six main classes. The uh, simplest one to understand is counts. We, of course, we can count nuclei, and this is a proxy for the number of cells uh, in the well. But we can also count objects, whether it's spot in the nucleus, spot in the cytoplasm, or other subcellular compartments. Since we're using microscopy, we can also measure uh, the position or distance of subcellular objects, uh, uh, such as, again, uh, spots, either um, between um, uh, themselves or between the objects and other uh, cellular hallmarks, such as, for example, uh, the nuclear envelope. Of course, we can measure relative differences in intensity uh, between different cells and between uh, different treatments. But it's also possible to uh, um, uh, generate information about the texture of uh, fluorescence uh, inside these cells. Um, texture or um, differences in the distribution or in the morphology of the staining uh, inside the cells. It's also possible to measure morphology, area, uh, presence of uh, protrusions, uh, such as in this case. And in the end, uh, another and the final class is uh, clustering or relational properties where uh, we can uh, determine, for example, if a cell is close to other cells or, for example, if uh, nuclei tend to cluster, such as uh, when uh, syncytia are formed, where multi multinucleated uh, cells uh, are formed. So, um, in thinking about performing an high-throughput imaging assay, especially for screening purposes, what should I think about uh, before starting? 
the first question, and this first question is true for any kind of experiment, what do I want to ask? What is my biological question? Because this will dictate uh, all of the, the experimental system, the assay, the reagents, and the statistics, and so on and so forth. The second obvious question is, uh, after I know what I want to measure is, what am I using? What is the reagent that I'm, am I going to, to measure? Um, what, is there, what is the reagent that I'm going to use to uh, address my biological question? And so, what are the fluorescent markers? Is it a protein? Is it an antibody? Is it a live cell uh, experiment? Is it a fixed uh, cell experiment? Is it an immunofluorescence experiment? Now that I have the marker, what, 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 um, what I'm actually going to measure with eye content image analysis? Am I going to measure counts, um, uh, difference in fluorescence intensity, uh, number of cells, all of this, and so on and so forth. What cell line am I going to use? This is particularly important because we want to make sure that uh, cells are, if possible, and you know, there's some exceptions these days, they're uh, adhering to the cell uh, bottom. Uh, can my cells grow in 96 or 34 volt plate? Uh, is my the biological phenomenon that I want to measure is it conserved in 96 or 34 volt plates? Does the assay miniaturize well? And once they, uh, from a biological standpoint, uh, I can actually uh, reproduce my assay from a low throughput format, like a six volt plate into a 304 volt plate, can I actually measure uh, the phenotype using automated image analysis? And finally, and most importantly, especially for screens, do I have biological controls? If I want to measure something, I need to know what is my assay window, what is the quality uh, of the assay. So biological controls are essential. In terms of fluorescent markers, uh, we can use uh, markers to um, identify genomic loci or mRNA molecules. And so we can use um, um, fluorescently labeled uh, oligo uh, probes. Uh, such as in the case of fluorescence uh, in situ hybridization or FISH, uh, as indicated uh, here. These are just two applications from collaborators, past collaborators in, in our lab, uh, so that again we can identify genomic loci, and uh, this is going to be the theme of the first story that I'm going to tell you about today. Of course, uh, one of the main uses of ITOPOD imaging uh, is to measure the behavior of cellular markers fused to fluorescent uh, proteins, and this, of course, allows the use of live cell uh, imaging. Uh, but we can also use fluorescent dyes that specifically bind to subcellular structures. I mentioned, of course, um, um, uh, DNA uh, stains, but there is a variety of stains that are specific for uh, mitochondria, cellular membranes, and other organelles. Um, and finally, uh, it's also possible to use uh, immunofluorescence, and so combinations, of course, of primary and secondary fluorescently labeled antibodies uh, to measure uh, endogenous proteins. And this, of course, it's advantageous when one doesn't want to uh, engineer uh, a cell line. Uh, one of the most important uh, assay development parameters uh, when thinking about high throughput imaging uh, is and it seems silly, but uh, it's optimizing cell density. And this is because this is just an example of a titration of cell numbers for this um, uh, colo uh, colorectal cancer cell line, HD116, uh, where uh, we have uh, an optimal uh, cell density here. We have two spars, and this is basically wasting wasting time because the microscope will mostly acquire images of uh, semi-empty uh, fields of view. This is definitely too dense uh, because here cells are so packed that the algorithms won't be able to actually segment the cells. And then of course this particular cell line, it's kind of clumpy, uh, grows in, in, in clumps, but this is uh, fairly acceptable. We have a sufficient uh, number of cells. This is a, uh, these are images of part of 20x. Uh, but um, we have sufficient amount of, amount of cells, but we also uh, can uh, segment, segment it. So the software can actually uh, tell them uh, apart. We definitely want to uh, optimize uh, the uh, fluorescent stains, both in terms of uh, uh, concentration and, and time of staining and so on and so forth. This is just an amplified uh, immuno, uh, in, uh, amplified uh, DNA uh, fish in this particular case, and this is a 
the worst example that I could choose for this slide, um, you can actually see that we can actually see uh, our um, um, genomic uh, loci only when we use higher concentrations of this particular oligoprobe and longer quantities of, of uh, amplification. But this is just an example to say that uh, whenever you're testing a new antibody or a new reagent, especially in 384 row plates and in anti row plates, one should definitely uh, do some assay development and try different concentrations and uh, different staining times. If performing um, um, an sRNA screen, another uh, very important step, uh, as most of you know, uh, to um, deliver sRNAs into cells, we need to use transfection uh, reagents in mammalian cells, in drosophila cells, this is different. And so it's extremely important to optimize the conditions for uh, transfections. And so what I'm showing you here is a titration of uh, transfection, uh, these particular uh, transfection reagents uh, with different uh, sRNAs. And again, here the importance of uh, controls. So we have no sRNA, a negative control sRNA that shouldn't do anything, two positive sRNA and another negative control at two different concentrations of uh, oligos. And the idea here is that the positive control sRNA should kill cells and the negative control uh, sRNA should not. And this so killing cells should, it's, it's a proxy for transfection efficiency. And so you see that this is uh, the uh, appropriate uh, condition because at this concentration of transfection reagent, the negative control has uh, no effect uh, when compared to the no sRNA, uh, whereas at higher uh, concentration of transfection reagent, uh, we see, we observe uh, toxicity, uh, indicating uh, that uh, this effect is completely uh, aspecific. And this shows the same with two different uh, sRNAs. So now I want to uh, switch a little bit uh, gears and uh, tell you a little bit, uh, focus moving from uh, high throughput imaging more to the high throughput imaging facility or high tip. Um, and, and to what we do to then introduce uh, the two different stories. So we are a shared resource for NCI and NIH investigators, uh, and our goal is to provide them with the necessary uh, tools uh, to um, um, design, uh, set up, and execute high-throughput imaging assays. And so the way it, we work uh, is that our collaborators, and we mostly work in a collaborative fashion, our collaborators bring the biological question, and we provide uh, the technology, as I mentioned before, to address uh, these biological questions. But we also, one of the strengths of the facility over the years, it's also uh, been the development of new high throughput imaging assays, uh, so that uh, we'd like to believe uh, that the development of new technology also uh, drive uh, uh, our collaborators uh, to ask questions that were uh, previously uh, unaddressable. And so, um, as I mentioned before, uh, there's different ways to use uh, high throughput imaging. Uh, we mostly perform focus screens with uh, focused uh, libraries of uh, sRNAs. I won't talk about these today. And then we use, for the most part, uh, high throughput imaging in a deep imaging mode. Uh, where again, we acquire data about large number of cells to precisely quantify generally extremely rare biological events or quantify heterogeneity in the cellular population. And so the two stories that I'm going to tell you about uh, today <coughs> are going to deal uh, with uh, this theme of uh, deep imaging. So um, the first asset, the first collaboration, uh, deals with the, uh, the use of high imaging to study nuclear architecture. As most of you know, Mammalian uh, uh, genomes are organized, uh, are uh, specially organized in a hierarchical manner, uh, starting from uh, the subdivision of the primary sequence in uh, inactive, non-coding, and uh, active region, roughly. Uh, and then uh, the linear DNA organizes into 3D uh, chromatin uh, domains. Generally, uh, this organization is driven by uh, activity, by transcriptional uh, activity. Uh, and then chromatin domains can form uh, super domains through mechanisms that are still fully understood. And then these super domains organize in chromosome territories that partition different chromosomes inside the interface of cell nucleus. The first story that I'm going to tell you about today uh, focuses on uh, how uh, the uh, chromatin domains are organized uh, in uh, the mammalian uh, cell nucleus. 
So uh, historically speaking, there's been two classes of techniques uh, to study uh, nuclear architecture. I'll start from the most recent one, uh, which is based on biochemical techniques. These techniques uh, fall into uh, the family of chromosome conformation capture, or 3C techniques, chip and chip pet. And these have really revolutionized the field in the past five uh, to 10 years. These techniques uh, allow the visualization of 3D genome structure, genome-wide, uh, so at very high uh, resolution. And they're really, really, uh, have really, have been really, really important. The other uh, kind of techniques is microscopy based, and this is what I'm gonna show you uh, uh, about today. And again, as I mentioned before, uh, these techniques take advantage of the use of DNA fluorescence in situ hybridization. And so with DNA fish, with uh, uh, sequence specific probes, it's possible to uh, identify specific uh, genomic loci in the nucleus that uh, look like uh, dots in a fluorescent microscopy uh, image. And of course, uh, we can also visualize uh, chromosome territories with uh, chromosome paints, but I'm not gonna talk uh, about this uh, today. Each of these techniques has uh, its uh, strengths and its uh, weaknesses. So um, um, 3C techniques uh, are, uh, again, as I said before, are uh, genome-wide, but still microscopy provides you a real, uh, with microscopy you can really measure uh, distances. Uh, the main drawback of microscopy techniques is that, as opposed to biochemical techniques, the throughput of uh, microscopy, in particular of DNA fish, has historically been very low. So that um, looking, it was possible to look only at few loci uh, in a single experiment or uh, in a single uh, project. This changed a few years ago, uh, thanks to an extremely uh, talented staff scientist uh, in the Misteli lab, Sigar. Uh, uh, Sigal uh, Shakar, who basically managed to miniaturize uh, DNA fish in a 384 well format. And she was the first one uh, to use um, high throughput uh, fish uh, and high throughput imaging to perform uh, the first uh, sRNA screen, focused sRNA screen of uh, mammalian factors uh, that uh, regulate uh, radial positioning of uh, loci um, in mammalian cells a technique that uh, she uh, named HIPMAP. So what are the weaknesses and, and the strengths of HIPMAP as, as opposed to HIC? As I mentioned before, HIC techniques are genome-wide, they're high resolution, but they cannot measure real physical distances. Um, HIC chromosome confirmation capture is only based on uh, interaction frequencies, not uh, distances. Um, it can only measure pairwise interactions, and uh, for the most part, it can only perform population, population average measurements. And I put two asterisks here because these techniques are advancing so fast that in the past couple of years, uh, there's been actually an example of a single uh, cell IC. HIMAP, on the other hand, is candidate-based, so we cannot look at the entire <coughs> genome uh, in a single uh, project. Have a fairly limited resolution, um, I put here 100 KB, but um, there is now these, um, with new oligo paint probes, it's actually possible to go down to probably uh, 10, 20 KB. But they have the great advantages that uh, with these, uh, with heat map and with microscopy, we can actually measure distances, we can measure in clustering interaction, and we can distinguish uh, different uh, single, um, single alleles inside, inside uh, the cell. And this uh, allows to uh, address some biological, interesting biological questions that cannot be addressed by IC. So uh, Elizabeth uh, Finn uh, from the Misteli lab decided to use HIPMAP uh, in uh, not just to look at a few loci, but potentially look at, at tens or hundreds of different loci just to see whether she could capture more gener general uh, rules of how the genome is organized. So what she did was to use uh, DNA fish and high throughput imaging. As you can see here, uh, she stained cells with three uh, different probes in uh, three different color, and this is uh, DAPI, this is a cell nucleus. And use high throughput imaging and high content image analysis to find all the spots uh, in the cell and measure relative distances uh, between uh, these spots. Now, what she also, the, the, she also had another piece of information, and this is the actual piece of information that she started with, which is 
uh, um, IC data, and so interaction frequencies data for all the loci that she uh, measured. And so in this particular example, she has a triad of uh, loci, a locus here, an anchor, and two other loci, uh, one uh, upstream and one downstream at exactly the same uh, uh, distance. So in this case, uh, uh, genomic distance is the same. But what hi uh, told uh, Elizabeth was that uh, these loci interacted at uh, fairly different frequencies um, uh, even though they were at exactly genomic distance. And so the first question was, this is what IC is telling us, um, is, is this true in real physical space? And by measuring thousands uh, of uh, spots uh, in these cells with high-throughput imaging, uh, what she could uh, uh, find was that Indeed, uh, when looking at distributions of uh, minimum distances uh, between uh, spots, uh, when uh, taking a cutoff of 350 uh, nanometers, the, uh, the uh, interaction uh, that uh, showed uh, lower interaction frequencies in IC was also showing uh, a lower frequency of interactions with uh, fluorescence, uh, with uh, uh, DNA fission heat map. Now, the other important thing, though, is that uh, these distances are extremely heterogeneous, and so that you can see that while there's indeed uh, more interactions at this cutoff, uh, these two <coughs> distributions are heavily uh, overlapping, uh, indicating uh, that uh, just looking at interaction frequencies is good, but it's not just the only way to look at these interactions. So this was just one, what was actually two interactions with just three loci. She expanded the analysis to more than 100 loci. And she uh, spread uh, these DNA fish probes and these hallmarks uh, or milestones uh, across uh, different uh, chromosomes and measure all the possible distances uh, between, uh, between these chromosomes to get a more general view of how um, um, distances between different genomic loci compare uh, with high C data. And so with this system, uh, she could ask three questions. The first one, again, as I mentioned, do high C interactions correlate with physical measurements? How prevalent are these uh, high C interactions in the populations? What I see tells us is that some interactions are uh, extremely strong, uh, but nobody really knows in how many cells uh, uh, these interactions happen. <coughs> Uh, do they happen at not at very high strength in all the population? There's very few cells where these interactions are extremely strong. And the other question that it uh, could not be addressed by high C is do sister loci affect each other in uh, the nucleus? So that if uh, one uh, homologous chromosome has two loci interacting, does this mean that the same uh, loci on, on, on the other homologous chromosome uh, are interacting uh, as well? And also, um, does the formation of uh, interactions in um, two uh, different uh, loci, does this um, uh, favor interaction with a third, uh, with a third uh, loci? So can we form ternary interactions? So to address the first question, uh, she performed heat map analysis on hundreds of uh, these interactions. And what she could uh, observe uh, was that uh, the interaction frequency as measured uh, with um, heat map correlated extremely well uh, with uh, high C, uh, and this was good. So this addresses the first question. Uh, also to mention, it's important to mention that uh, most of this relationship is probably uh, driven uh, by uh, genomic uh, distance, uh, pretty much like in high C, and this was uh, previously known. But also what's very it's important is that uh, for, with exception of very few, very strong interactions of uh, loci that are very close together, the vast majority of intrachromosomal interaction, and again, this is not intrachromosomal interaction, this is, uh, these are all measurements on uh, probes on the same chromosome, actually happen in a fairly uh, small uh, percentage of cells that can vary between 3 and 30 percent, depending on how uh, one uh, measure uh, these, um, these interactions. And so the, the, these genomic interactions are very heterogeneous in the population. Uh, to address uh, the third question, uh, if I have uh, one association on one homologous chromosome, 
since our, these are diploid cells, uh, we have two copies of the same uh, blockers in the same cell. Uh, there's this favor interaction with the, the second pair, and this doesn't seem to be the case. And in fact, uh, the frequencies observed uh, frequencies of uh, double interactions are uh, not deviating, uh, significantly deviating uh, from uh, the model uh, interactions just based on random uh, frequencies. And the same uh, is true for uh, ternary uh, interactions. Again, uh, model uh, interactions and, exp uh, and observed uh, interactions are not very different, indicating uh, that, again, genomic uh, uh, organization is fairly heterogeneous. So to summarize this, quickly summarize this first part, uh, IC and hydroput fish uh, are largely concordant, uh, but uh, interaction events are generally rare uh, in the population, so that what we see with IC with population-based techniques is actually an average of many different conformations. And uh, some more recent work, published work, it's actually uh, supporting this view of the fact that in a population, different cells have different uh, genomic uh, structures. And uh, that, again, genomic uh, organization is heterogeneous. Now, let me quickly uh, switch to the second uh, um, I2Code imaging uh, assay that I want to tell you about today. What we see uh, up until now, it's uh, everything was done on fixed cells. Now I want to move to live cell uh, imaging. And so um, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but we are actually part of the Laboratory of Receptor Biology and Gene Expression at NCI. So it's not, uh, um, it's not serendipitous that uh, most of our uh, collaborators are actually interested uh, in studying uh, gene expression. And now more and more, uh, uh, more and more, they're actually interested in studying the kinetics <coughs> of uh, gene expression. And so. Uh, how gene expression works uh, over time and possibly uh, in, in, in a live uh, single cell. And so there's a series of, of uh, techniques that uh, take advantage of uh, live uh, cell microscopy and uh, gene arrays, as I show you uh, in a little bit, that allows, I've, I've allowed researchers for uh, now quite some time uh, to actually uh, measure uh, transcription at the single transcription site in living cells over time. And this gives us information uh, that it's dynamic and most importantly that it's single cell uh, information. So how can we measure transcription in live single cells or visualize transcription in live single cells? This is thanks to the development of a hybrid RNA protein system uh, from uh, bacteriophages. Um, there's either PP2 or MS2, now there's other ones. Uh, these systems uh, are based on the use of uh, one uh, of hairpins uh, of uh, RNAs. These are uh, sequence-specific uh, RNAs that uh, form hairpins, again, are derived from bacteriophages, uh, that bind uh, their cognate uh, co coat protein, so this binding is uh, sequence-specific. And of course, this uh, protein can uh, actually be genetically engineered, can be tagged with a fluorescent uh, tag, so that uh, now by uh, tagging the fluorescent protein, we can actually know where the RNA is. This has been uh, developed uh, over the past uh, 20 years uh, in many labs, has been used to study transcription uh, in yeast cells and also in mammalian cells, also by Paolo and uh, Alessandro a few years ago. What uh, Ian Wan, a uh, postdoctoral fellow uh, from uh, one of our collaborators, the Larson lab at, at NCI, wanted to do was to study transcri endogenous transcription of uh, genes in uh, mammalian cells, and not only transcription, but also splicing. So her idea uh, was to uh, insert arrays of uh, these uh, repeats, uh, genomically integrate them, uh, these stem loops, into intronic uh, sequences, so that when an RNA uh, polymerase uh, travels through these DNA stem loops, an RNA stem loop, an array of uh, RNA stem loops is produced, and these arrays can bind uh, GFP. So that in theory, and in practice, as you'll see in a little bit, it's possible uh, to visualize uh, the progress of transcription as an increase in fluorescence intensity that then plateaus and that then uh, um, drops uh, due to 
the excision of the intronic, um, uh, the intronic uh, uh, RA uh, sequence, which is either degraded or uh, quickly diffuses uh, away. So this is <coughs> what this actually looks like in a living cell. You can see here in this uh, yellow box, uh, there's a bright dot that appears uh, and disappears. And this tells you something, immediately tells you something about the nature of transcription in live single cells. And this is that transcription is not a continuous process, but it's rather happens in bursts. So it's a, bur it's a bursting process. And so when we convolute, uh, since transcription uh, likely happens um, in, with multiple polymerases uh, tra traveling at once uh, over the genes, we can measure the co these convoluted uh, profiles and this would it's actually measured uh, from the images. So we have these intensity profiles where we have times on the x-axis and fluorescence intensity on the y-axis. And as you can see here, this fluorescence intensity profile, the transcription site, show that, again, there's this burst of activity punctuated by intervals of inactivity that can also be uh, fairly, uh, fairly long. So these traces are particularly interesting uh, because uh, our collaborators can actually extract quantitative biophysical parameters that tells us something, not just about the biophysics of the process, but also about the molecular biology of the process. And I'll get to this in a little bit. The two parameters that I'll talk the most about today are what are called on times or the width of the peak. So this is how, how uh, wide these peaks are. And off times or the interval between two consecutive bursts of transcriptional activity. And so off times are the easiest to understand. They basically tell us how often uh, the promoter is firing, and so they tell they tell us something about transcription, transcriptional initiation. Whereas on times are uh, directly correlated uh, to both uh, the time uh, that uh, is required for the polymerase uh, to travel from the beginning of the stem loops all the way uh, to the three prime uh, splice site, and also to the time that is required for splicing. So this is all fine and dandy. Um, the Larson lab has used this technique in mammalian cells for quite some time. The only real problem is that the process is extremely labor intensive, both in terms of image acquisition, uh, image analysis, uh, and uh, data analysis. And so that one postdoc or one postdoctoral student can actually characterize uh, one gene uh, per year. This is okay, but they want to characterize more genes and potentially look at transcription on not one or two genes, but potentially tens or hundreds of uh, different uh, endogenous genes. So this is where we at HITIF got involved. Uh, so our goal was to basically increase the throughput of transcription dynamic measurements and, and collaborate with the Larson lab and the Hager labs, which we'll show you in a little bit, to try and make this process a little bit more uh, automated. So this meant um, basically coming up with an assay uh, that was um, could be performed on a high throughput microscopy platform. And of course, it also meant uh, to devise a high throughput tracking um, uh, uh, image analysis pipeline to track nuclei and uh, those spots uh, in uh, all the cells. So in terms of image acquisition <laughs> analysis, I won't spend much time uh, reading all the parameters. We use a uh, high throughput uh, spinning disk confocal microscope, the Yokogawa CV7000. The assay was performed in 96 well plates. We use 4DX and 60X uh, objectives. Uh, we performed the image acquisition in 3D and we um, performed on the fly image uh, projection. Um, uh, the, uh, the time lapse were performed at, very, at fairly uh, short intervals in up to 36 uh, fields of view uh, per uh, experiment. And the experiments were performed uh, anywhere between a few hours all the way to uh, overnight, so a very long period. So that overall, uh, each experiment generated up to 20,000 uh, images. So this meant, uh, and I'll, uh, before getting to the image analysis pipeline, I introduced uh, one application of this system. So that Jana Stavreva, the staff scientist uh, from one of our collaborators' lab, uh, the Hager lab, what she wanted to use this pipeline, this, this technique for, uh, was to not necessarily measure uh, splicing, but rather just plain transcriptional initiation 
uh, from a promoter uh, responsive uh, to um, glucocorticoid uh, receptor uh, binding uh, um, hormones, uh, so GR. Uh, and so uh, since she wanted to study um, uh, GR uh, transcription, she uh, inserted um, uh, several uh, uh, repeats of these PP7 RAs uh, downstream uh, of this promoter in the pre prime uh, uh, site in the, uh, of uh, this particular uh, reporter. So these are images from one of these uh, cell lines. Uh, this is the PP7 GFP channel. Uh, she also uh, used uh, live cell uh, DNA stain, uh, sir DNA, uh, for reasons that will become uh, immediately uh, apparent. And so uh, it's not possible to see what's really going on at the, at the level of transcription here. So I'm just zooming on one particular cell. What you can see here, uh, this particular cell line has six uh, integration sites. As you can see here, cells move, rotate, but what is clear is that different transcription sites um, work at, um, are activated at different, uh, well, we don't know if they're independent or not, but it's like a Christmas tree coming up and all the time. So the goal here was to find the cell, fix the cells in, 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 in informatic space, as we've seen a little bit, um, find the spots, and basically automatically measure when the spots were on and off. Uh, we did this uh, thanks to Reddy Gudla, our image analysis uh, scientist at, at HITEV, uh, with some help from George Saki at CBIT. And the idea here was to get uh, 2DT image uh, uh, movies as input, segment <coughs> them automatically, track nuclei, uh, uh, segment the spot in the unregistered nuclei, register the nuclei to block them uh, in uh, space and so that they could not rotate, um, filter uh, some spots, register the spots in space because the spots are moving in a, in a constrained uh, environment once that the cell is uh, fixed, uh, uh, track uh, the spots, uh, and then automatically or semi-automatically generate uh, spot intensity tracks. So these are example of all the steps of the pipeline. Uh, this is the segmentation of uh, the movies. So you can see uh, segmentation work decently well. I must confess this is version 1.0 of the pipeline. We are actually improving most if not uh, all the steps. Um, this is uh, tracking uh, of the cells. And I think that this is uh, uh, Reddy's major achievement, right? um, which is to register the nuclei in high throughput. As mentioned before, cells move uh, and rotate. We have multiple transcription sites. So if we didn't register cells, uh, we wouldn't know which of the transcription sites is coming up at each point. Reddy fix all the cells that you saw in that image. This is just one of them. And then uh, apply the rigid body transformation uh, to the GFP channel so that now the spots were blinking, but blinking in a constrained space. Once the nucleus was registered in the GFP space, it then uh, performed uh, spot detection and then uh, used the lab tracker uh, so that now we knew for each spot uh, we could track it uh, in uh, the movies. So the, the idea is that now for this particular cell, uh, as I mentioned before, there's six integration sites. For God knows what reason, only five of the six uh, are firing. We have five uh, different uh, traces uh, that in this case are overlapped. Uh, but we can also model uh, the traces uh, with uh, a two-state hidden Markov model. This is just one way to analyze the data. Uh, this is where our collaborators have more experience. This is what. Uh, they started with, but they're now actually applying different techniques. But the bottom line here is that now from these uh, traces, we can uh, automatically detect off times uh, and uh, on uh, times. And this is just for one cell, but the goal here is to do it in a decent throughput uh, uh, fashion. And so uh, these are chemograms, are ways to basically compress all the transcription traces uh, for multiple transcription uh, sites, 
as you can see here, on the y-axis, we have 83 different transcription sites. On the x, uh, we have uh, time. And in grayscale is the fluorescence intensity at a particular, uh, uh, particular transcription site. And as indicated uh, before, but this time with hundreds of cells, what we can see is that transcription is a bursting process, and also that for this particular uh, reporter, transcription is also an heterogeneous, fairly heterogeneous process. Uh, doesn't look like there's major coordination. Uh, now, since we have a pipeline to also automatically extract on and off times, we can actually uh, extract hundreds or thousands of these on and off times that can be uh, analyzed in, um, in aggregate. So what you can see here, the first, the upper two panels are cumulative distributions of respectively on and off times. This is just a control. These were two experiments uh, performed on different days. Reproducibility, the uh, curves are perfectly overlapping, which is good, means that the experiment uh, is uh, reproducible. But most importantly, from a biological uh, standpoint, what was uh, most interesting was that uh, by using two different uh, inducers of GR transcription of this particular reporter, dexamethasone and uh, corticosterone, uh, what you can see is that the synthetic version, uh, which is a known stronger binder, more potent inducer of transcription, actually leads to shorter off times uh, when compared to the natural, uh, less uh, strong uh, version of the hormone, uh, indicating uh, that indeed transcription is likely modulated uh, in terms of off times. And we can exclude that on times are also regulated, but at this sampling frequency, at 10 hundred seconds, we can't really say much about the on time. Now, for something similar, I'll go back to, but at the same time different, I'll go back to Ihan's project. And so, the goal of Ihan, as I mentioned before, was to measure endogenous transcription and splicing in tens or hundreds of uh, different uh, endogenous uh, promoters. So she built a gene trap vector, I won't go into the details, uh, but the idea is that this lentiviral vector uh, can uh, integrate, uh, can be used to transduce a population of cells, uh, the, as many of you know, a lentiviral vector is integrated in a pseudo-random manner with a certain preference for the five prime uh, regions of actively transcribed genes. Uh, the, so the, in theory, and hopefully, uh, we would have a collection of cells, heterogeneous population of cells, each carrying a different integration in a different gene of this gene trap vector from molecular biology trick and the use of a recombinase, uh, they eliminated the uh, selection marker so that uh, now the MS2 repeats could be transcribed under the control of an endogenous, an endogenous gene. This, of course, was an heterogeneous pool of cells. So what Ihan did was to use fax cell sorting uh, to single cell sort cells into a 96 well plate and then used <coughs> the CV7000 to perform a colony screen uh, use next generation sequencing to precisely identify the integration uh, site and then perform in the uh, high throughput imaging uh, characterization <coughs> with high throughput imaging and this is what I'm going to tell you about in the next few slides. So this is an imaging, it, it's an example of what endogenous transcription in live cells uh, looks like. This is one particular clone where the, integrate, when, where the gene trap vector integrating in sec 16A. Doesn't really matter what, what gene it is but as you can see there's transcription sites in different cells firing up at uh, different times. So she started with a collection of 940 insertions in a heterogeneous pool. By sequencing, she determined that she had uh, 772 uh, integrations in introns. She decided to screen 400 colonies. She could verify 66 of these colonies by both next generation sequencing and um, and imaging. Uh, she further uh, narrowed down to 24, so some of them were the same colony appearing twice or three times, and she ended up with a validated set of 11 single insertions, 11 single uh, clones, that are uh, indicated here in this uh, cardiogram. And so 11 genes doesn't seem much in the high throughput imaging world. Uh, we go to conferences where people screen millions of compounds. Uh, but 
we can now look at about uh, 10 uh, genes per month, which is a substantial improvement over the one gene uh, per month um, throughput uh, that the Larson lab and the Hager lab had uh, before. So how does endogenous transcription uh, look like? Uh, this is one particular gene, SLC2A1. Um, transcription is heterogeneous. And this is something that we could have not uh, observed uh, by just doing <coughs> RT-PCR or RNA-seq. Uh, also, because now we have a time profile, it's not just that this is all uh, single. <coughs> and so this technique really provides a new, a new view of uh, transcription. So the second observation that he had made was that uh, different, uh, different endogenous genes actually behave fairly differently. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, so this particular gene, ERF1, uh, actually transcribes much less and has fairly different transcription uh, initiation dynamics. And this is just an example of three different genes, uh, three uh, ide ideal cells. Uh, this gene here, ERF1, transcribes once in a while and then doesn't happen. I'm going to give you the answer to your question in a second. SLC2A1 uh, has an intermediate behavior and rho A actually uh, transcribes uh, a lot. Now looking at all 11 genes at once and looking at all the cells, all the transcription sites, they looked at, this is uh, an aggregate of 14,000 uh, different uh, on and off times, uh, you can see that off distributions are uh, gene specific. And so, at least to my knowledge, uh, this is one of the first studies uh, where uh, researchers have actually looked at more than one or two endogenous genes at the same time. Uh, and hopefully, uh, by improving molecular biology and uh, image analysis pipeline, our goal is to now look at potentially either the same gene in potentially hundreds of different conditions or hundreds of uh, different genes. Anyway, to summarize this third part, uh, we develop an open source image, uh, um, uh, high content image analysis platform for live cell assays, mm -hmm. uh, and we used it uh, to provide our collaborators with beginning to end measurements of transition dynamics at the single cell level in a fairly high throughput format. And the message here is that transcription firing in RNA splicing rates seem to be heterogeneous. And in particular, off time seems to be uh, gene specific. And this, of course, now opens up the possibility of using this assay uh, to perturb the system to test whether chromatin regulation, uh, promoter enhancer contacts, or other molecular mechanisms are actually what's hiding uh, behind uh, this mechanism. And finally, final, final. Uh, high throughput imaging is a powerful technique to systematically integrate cellular pathways, and in particular, I showed you two examples of deep imaging, where we used high throughput imaging for large scale precise measurements of rare biological events at the suborganism. Acknowledgements: Elizabeth from the Nistelli lab, Ihan from the Larson lab, uh, Diana from the Hager lab, and then uh, Reggie Goodman. And with this, I thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to take questions.